Morning, church. Let's go to the Lord in prayer. Father, we are grateful to be here today, and we're grateful, uh, Father, that your mercies are new every day. And every time it snows, I'm just reminded uh, that the blood of Jesus makes us as white as snow. Uh, So, Father, thank you for uh, sending your Son to pour out his blood for us, to make us clean, to make us righteous, not a righteousness of our own, but a righteousness through Jesus. Father, we're so grateful for that. I just want to quickly pray for all the churches around us that are also gathering this morning to lift up the name of Jesus. Father, may your Holy Spirit be manifest in their gatherings. May Jesus alone be glorified. And may many people come to know the saving grace of our Lord. It's in Jesus' name we pray. Amen. All right, kiddies, kiddos, uh, kiddos, all right. They're too excited, Carmen. They can't walk. They're too excited. Apparently, that makes my kids excited the entire morning, uh, as many times as they run back and forth. Oh, there he is. He's hiding under a chair. (laughs) All right, well, good morning. I'm glad you guys are here this morning. Uh, We are in week two, part two, of our newest sermon series called Denied. Why don't you look at your neighbor this morning, tell him, Denied, I don't know, I I didn't think that one through. Give him a high five and then deny it, okay. Man, I've gotten so many awesome words of encouragement from last week, uh, from part one, Uh, just constantly you guys messaging me, telling how much uh, you guys enjoyed uh, the first part of the series. Uh, today's probably going to let you down, but that's an okay. Uh, okay, we're in part two of Denied, and today we're going to be talking about something um, that I hope encourages you to serve. Um, and I want to start just by saying this. Our Lord Jesus came not to be served, but to serve. Came not to be served, but to serve. I want to start off this way. If somebody said that you are always doing something, what would it be? Like, for instance, my kids always say, well, they always say, okay, here we go. Um, Daddy, you're always drinking coffee. You're right, I am, right? If somebody said that you are always doing something, what would it be? Man, Ray, you're always falling asleep at work, right? Knock it off. That's probably not true, right? Ben, you're always taking such good care of your patients. Keep up the good work. I don't know why I gave you a bad one and you a good one. Um, Right, okay. So if somebody described your action with the word always, what would it be? He is always doing this, or like she is always doing that. Let, Let me rephrase it another way. If somebody found out that you were giving a TED Talk, you guys know what TED Talks are? They've become really popular over the last five to seven years. So a TED Talk is like a 20-minute talk about something that you're passionate about. If, If somebody walked up to you and said, man, I heard you're giving a TED Talk, and it makes so much sense that you're talking about blank, what would it be, right? What would your TED Talk be about? What would others say that you're always doing? Maybe somebody walks up to you and says, man, you are so encouraging. You are always so encouraging to me. Where do you get that from? Or maybe somebody walks up to you and says, man, you're always complaining. You're so good at it. I'm pretty sure your spiritual gift is to complain about everything because you're always doing it. I'm not trying to be rude here. I'm not thinking anybody in particular. Maybe somebody walks up to you and says, man, you're always finding the good in somebody. You know that this person hates you, but you're still finding good in them. And you're always doing that with everybody. Like, where does that come from? Or maybe somebody walks up to you and says, man, you're always finding people's faults. You're so good at it, right? You, you can just naturally, you're like you don't even have to think about it. You can walk up to somebody and say, man, did you brush your hair this morning? 
you're always finding people's faults. What would people say you are always doing? Maybe it's working, right? You're always working. You get up at 5 a.m. and you don't get home till midnight. You're always working. Maybe it's you're always playing video games. Man, when are you going to put those things away? You're always playing video games. Maybe somebody walks up to you and says, you're always working out. Like, you look good, but man, you don't need to work out 10 hours a day, right? Maybe you're always working out. Maybe somebody walks up to you and says, man, you are always on Instagram. Like, I've never seen somebody post so many selfies. I saw a commercial yesterday about uh, the new iPhone that's coming out that their, their whole marketing scheme is slow fees. Like you can do a slow motion selfie and they're calling it a slow fee. It's a dumb name, but uh, I'm convinced that within a couple of years I will probably be doing it. Okay. Maybe somebody walks up to you and says, you're always sharing Christ. Like, I don't know how you do it in the workspace, in, in, at basketball games, wherever you are, you're always talking about your faith. Like, how do you do it? If somebody walks up to you and says, you're always doing something, what would it be? Our hope in this series of Denied is that we can start to realize in our own lives um, how some of us, let me rephrase that, how all of us in one aspect or another are self-serving, self-gratifying, and self-promoting. That's the culture we live in, you know. Serve yourself, gratify your flesh, gratify yourself, promote yourself. In fact, over the last couple of years, some of the best uh, sold books, right, New York Times Best sellers are these, The Art of Self-Promotion, Six Ways to Get Your Work Discovered. On the top of Forbes, uh, it was this one, 40 Ways to Self-Promote Without Being a Jerk. <laughs> like, even whenever we're thinking about self-serving, the culture with the, that we live in, a self-serving, self-gratifying, self-promoting culture, we're so used to it, and we're so used to everybody doing it, that now we're coming up of ways to do it without being a jerk about it. It's like, no, 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 you're good at this, just don't be a jerk. Okay. Um, a new statistic came out recently that says that 54%, think of this, 54% of adolescents under the age of 18 hope that for a career they become a YouTube star. 54% of adolescents under the age of 18 hope that for a career they became a star on YouTube. You know what we want to be? We want to be the GOAT. We want to be Michael Jordan. We want to be LeBron James. We want to be Babe Ruth. We, we want to be Mike Trout, right? We want to be the GOAT, the greatest of all time. At whatever we do, we want to be the GOAT. We want to be the greatest of all time, right? That's why this series is so important. That's why it's important that we talk about denying ourselves. Jesus said this, in the book of Matthew. And this is kind of what we're going to revolve around today. Jesus said this in the book of Matthew, chapter 23. The greatest among you, right? The goat among you, the greatest of all time among you, will be your servant. Jesus says this, and Jesus literally is the goat, right? Well, he's the lamb, right? He's the lamb of God, but Jesus is the greatest of all time at everything, right? Right? And Jesus says, whoever wants to be first must be last. Whoever wants to be the greatest among you must be what? Your servant. Whoever wants to be great must be a servant. 
Let me go back to this. If somebody said that you were always, always doing something, what would it be? Is it work? Man, you're always working. You're always out in the field. Is it complaining? You're always complaining. Is it encouragement? You're always so encouraging. If somebody said you're always doing something and you're the goat at it, you're the greatest of all time at whatever that is, what would it be? Um, There's a story in the book of Acts. Uh, In the book of Acts chapter 9, there was this lady named Tabitha. Now, I choose to use... Uh, her Roman name, Tabitha, because her Greek name is Dorcas. So we're going to go with her Roman name today. Um, and if you have a grandma named Dorcas or something, I'm not, I'm not like making fun of her or anything. I just personally wouldn't want my name to be Dorcas, okay? So there was this, there was this lady in, uh, in Rome, in Joppa. There was a disciple, and her name was Tabitha. What does it say she was doing? She was always doing what? Good. She was always doing good. And what else? Helping the poor. So whenever you look at this uh, lady named Tabitha, the perception of her among the people of Joppa is that she is always doing good and she is always helping the poor. That's what she was known for. Uh, if you keep reading in the book of Acts, just a few verses after this, you're going to discover that, uh, that, uh, that she was always sewing uh, coats for poor people. I can't imagine what Tabitha had done, but, but according to Peter, whenever he walks up to uh, this group of women that are standing around Tabitha after she has died, they're all showing Peter her, their jackets. Tabitha made me this jacket. Tabitha made me this coat. She was always doing good. She was always sewing jackets and quilts for people, and she was always caring for the widows. It's quite interesting that just a few verses after this, it it says that a large group of women were surrounding Tabitha because she had passed away. But she was always doing good. Peter walks in to the upper room where, where Tabitha was laying, and she was dead. So Peter walks in, and he looks at this group of women that are all showing him their coats, And Peter says, everybody leave the room. Everybody leave the room. And Peter kneels before Tabitha. And a resurrection occurred. Tabitha came and started breathing again. Her heart started pumping again. She stood up, and Tabitha is alive again. After all these women are standing around mourning her loss, Peter walks in, prays, and raises her from the dead. He walks back out, and all of a sudden, many people are starting uh, to profess Christ as Lord. Instead of always serving herself, Tabitha chose to serve others. Now, this is just one example among many throughout the Bible, but I've never really thought about this verse in that way, but I love it. She was always doing good. She was the goat at it. And she was always helping the poor. Instead of serving herself, she always served others. Which sparks a question in my mind. How do we become a faithful servant? Right? Many of us are going to profess Jesus as Lord, We're going to profess Jesus as Savior, but for better or worse, probably worse, whenever people look at our lives, whenever they say he's always or she's always doing blank, it probably doesn't revolve around Jesus. Now, maybe I'm wrong with this, but I'd say the vast majority of us sitting in this room, when I said, what are you always doing, probably said work or chilling on the couch with my family, or something like that. So how do we become known for always doing good and always serving others like Tabitha? Um, I want to start with uh, a story of a king. I want to start with the story of a king. His name was David. Now, many of us know David as a war hero, right? 
David was a king in the Old Testament. In the Psalms, it says that David was a man after God's own heart. David was a, a shepherd boy, right? And David rose to notoriety by doing what? Killing Goliath, right? So David slays Goliath, and, and David rises uh, to notoriety, becomes a king, becomes a war hero, and that kind of stuff. He's loved. He's honored. People are singing songs to him. David becomes a man after God's own heart and writes like the vast majority of the Psalms, right? But why was David great? I would argue that, that in the story of David and Goliath, God did the heavy lifting. But something preceded that that I think that we often gloss over. Most think that David was great because he won the battle against Goliath. But I think that David was great because he carried a basket. David was one of eight of his father Jesse's sons, and he was the youngest. So his seven older brothers are all in war. He's, they're all in war fighting against the Philistines. And one day his father Jesse said to him, it's this. Take this basket, take this basket of roasted grain and these ten loaves of bread and carry them quickly to your brothers. Right? All his brothers are fighting in a war against the Philistines. David's being held back, but now his father says, go make sure they're fed. And whenever you make sure they're fed, bring a report back to me. See how your brothers are getting along. And bring a report back to me on how they're doing. Now maybe I'm reading too much into this, and, but maybe I'm not. If you want to win the battle, first you have to carry the basket. David would have never seen what was happening if he didn't first serve. Now, David very could have easily looked at this and said, no, that's beneath me, right? I, I'm really good with the sling and a stone. Like, I can go fight right alongside them. But his father, Jesse, asked him something simple. Just take this basket of roasted grains and oats. Take it and go see how your brothers are getting along. And David did it. So if you want to win the battle, first maybe carry a basket. If you want to be great, Jesus says, whoever wants to be greatest among you must be what? Servant of all. If you want to be great, if you want to be great at whatever you are doing, first we have to understand how to make ourselves insignificant. Make ourselves out of the spotlight. Deny ourselves. Make ourselves nothing. Do I need to keep going? Humble ourselves and become others focused. Think about this. The one who slayed Goliath first brought a lunch. 553 years before Jesus rode into Jerusalem on a donkey, the prophet Zechariah prophesied that the king would ride humbly on a donkey. 553 years before it happened. You know, whenever you think about Jesus being the King of kings and the Lord of lords, the name above every name, you would think that whenever he was headed to do the most significant thing in human history, he would at least ride in on a white horse, right? You would think that he would have servants wrapped around him. You would think that his robe would be flowing off the side of a beautiful white horse. You would think that he would have a crown of gold placed upon his head. You know, when somebody significant is arriving into a town today, they don't ride in on a donkey. Think about 
if the President of the United States were coming to our city, he would be in a limo, surrounded by armed guards. He definitely wouldn't be riding into town on a donkey. I think that would be funny, but whatever. Jesus, as he's headed toward the cross, he knows that the time is coming for him to give up his life. So he comes into Jerusalem and he tells his disciples, go get this donkey. And the disciples are like, where am I supposed to get a donkey, right? What am I supposed to tell these people? And this is what he says in Luke chapter 19. If anyone asks you why you're stealing their donkey, I mean, let's just say it for what it is. Say, the Lord needs it. Now imagine being a disciple of Jesus, and you know that you're going to Jerusalem for a purpose, and now your Messiah tells you basically to go take somebody's donkey. And you're walking over there and you're like, oh, this looks like a donkey that could carry the Messiah. So you're walking over there and you're untying it from its post and taking the rope. And you're walking away. And some old boy, some old farmer or rancher looks at you and says, hey, that's my donkey. What are you doing? The Lord needs it. Oh, okay, well then go ahead, right? If the Lord needs it, then take it. You know, I don't know. I've never really thought about this until this week. I don't know anything about the person that owned this donkey. The Bible doesn't really say anything about this person. You don't know his or her name. You don't even know if it was a guy or a gal. You don't know their name. You don't know what they did for a living. You don't know, we don't know, if this was this dude's like only donkey, this was his only source of transportation, or if like he had a thousand donkeys. We don't know. Maybe he was a donkey raiser. I don't know. But I'll tell you this. A couple weeks ago, uh, my wife called me and said that uh, the car had broken down in the middle of the road with our kids in the back seat. And I'm thinking, oh, God. <laughs> she said that it broke down, immediately started back up, and she was able to make it back into the parking lot at the gas station, and then as soon as she parked it, it died. Wouldn't start back up. And the kids, and this is a block away from our house, so it's not like it's as far away. A block away from our house. And the first question my kids ask their mother, where are we going to sleep tonight? <laughs> it's like 10 o'clock in the morning, a block away from our house. And they're thinking, Oh, no, we're dead meat. Where, where are we going? So my wife calls me, and she said, hey, I'm broke down. And I'm like, oh, no, what do you mean you broke down? Well, I'm at, the, I'm at the gas station at Pete's, and I was like, okay, I'll be right there. I was here. I rushed to Parsons, got in the car, and it started right up. And I'm thinking, are you sure? That it died. Yes, it died. Kids? Yeah, Dad, it died. Okay. So I said, all right, Kate, take my truck and, uh, and go home. I'll take, I'll take the Land Cruiser and, we'll, and I'll get it to the house. That night, I started it and it fired right up, no problem. Drove it around town, no issue. The next morning, it was like 25 degrees, started it up fired right up, defroster, everything works, drove it around town, and I'm like, Kate, like, are you sure 
Like, I'm not doubting you, but are you sure that it died? Yes, lady, it died. Wouldn't start. And I'm like, man, I, like, I don't know what, like, I th- it's, it's in good working order. So I started researching. I started researching what happened. And I came across one article on Toyota Land Cruisers that said that there, there was a possibility. And I asked Caitlin, I said, was your gas light on? Yeah. Okay. How long had the gas light been on? Oh, a couple days. Huh. And I said, Caitlin, I'm pretty sure you ran out of gas. Well, why did it die on me then? Well, you see, it was so low on gas that the fuel filter got hot, and then when you put the cold gas on top of it, it shut down. Oh, okay. But for better or worse, we put the thing up for sale, a mechanic bought it, and he said it was awesome, and he took it to Wichita, and whatever. Okay. We were without a car for a day or two. We had my truck, but it got me thinking. If I was this owner of the donkey, and it just so happened to be my only donkey, how easily would I have just given it away to somebody that I didn't know and just say, the Lord needs it. Oh, yeah. Who? You're saying the Messiah came? Who? Who is he? I don't know who this guy was, but he offered a ride. He didn't charge. He didn't say, hey, have the donkey back by 9 p.m. You know, I just envision in my mind's eye this guy saying, look, if the Lord needs it, you can take it, but I, I need you to be, understand something. This is a luxury donkey got low miles it's got the highest end hooves this isn't some sort of eeyore donkey this is a this is this is a luxury donkey with all the features but if the lord needs it give it to him let me ask you a question what would it look like If we as a church helped people when we knew we would get nothing in return. Are we the kind of people that are willing to serve? Are you the kind of person that is willing to serve someone that you don't know? And get nothing in return. Are we the kind of people that, like David, will take a lunch to somebody knowing that they're going to laugh and mock us? Little teenage David bring a lunch to his older brothers. David says, I want to fight, I want to fight, I want to fight. No, get out of here. Are you still willing to do it? Are, Are we the kind of people that Whenever the Lord asks us to do something, like the disciples, go get this luxury donkey for me. Are we the kind of people that are going to serve and get nothing in return? I want you to search your heart for that, because I think on the surface level, most of us will instantly say, oh, yes. I'll give my shirt off the bat. I'll give my shirt or my hoodie to somebody knowing that I'm not going to get it back. Yeah, I would gladly serve. I think on the surface level, we're all there. But when it comes time to actually do it, are we still convicted of who we are in Christ and that Christ calls us to serve? Or are, we, are we still going to be there? And the greatest way to get there when the time comes is to prepare our minds and hearts now. Because opportunities are going to arise 
when you're going to get the opportunity to serve somebody knowing full well you're not going to get anything for it. And that's the image of Jesus. The Lord that we serve just before the Passover meal. He's sitting in Jerusalem on a Thursday night alongside his disciples in a secret room called the Upper Room. And Jesus had prepared his mind in the Garden of Gethsemane. He had prepared his heart even praying to God the Father, saying, Lord, take this cup from me. But when God the Father did not take the cup from him, his heart was prepared, knowing that he was about to give his life up. And he's sitting in the upper room with with his disciples, and you know what the conversation starts out as? Jesus, sitting in the middle of the table, and a conversation arises. Jesus, knowing that he's fixing to give his life and shed his blood for sinners. Knowing that he's fixing to get crucified on a a cross. is sitting at a table with his disciples, and this is the conversation. Lord, who amongst us is the greatest? Imagine being, just put your, put put Jesus' shoes on, put his sandals on, just for a moment. You were just in the garden of Gethsemane, and not only were you there, you're sweating blood, knowing that you're fixing to give your life up for these people. And you go into the upper room on a Thursday night, just before the Passover meal, and the argument that starts is the disciples looking at Jesus, saying, who amongst us gets to sit at your left hand, and who amongst us gets to sit at your right? When you sit upon your throne, who amongst us is going to be the greatest? So Jesus got up from the meal, took off his robe. And what did he do? He wrapped what? A towel around his waist. After that, he poured water into a basin. And what did he do? He began to wash his disciples' feet. Jesus is the goat. He's the greatest of all time sitting in a meal, and his disciples say, which of us is going to be the goat? Who among us is going to be the greatest? You know, in Jesus, what he could have done was rebuke them on the spot, saying, oh, you wicked servants. You wicked disciples. What do you mean who's going to be the greatest? Have you not learned anything from my teaching? He could have but he didn't. Instead, he takes off his robe, picks up a towel, wraps it around his waist, pours water into a basin, and he washes his disciples' feet. He could have said something. Instead, he demonstrated something. Imagine being at a restaurant just for a moment. You walk into a fancy restaurant and you walk in and it's cold outside and, and the server says, hey, can I take your coat? Yeah, take my coat, right? Can I get you something to drink? Yeah, I'll have a water on the rocks, please. That's always my joke. But can I take your coat? Can I get you something to drink? Can I wash your feet? <laughs> what? This threw the disciples off. 
In fact, one of them said, well, don't just wash my feet, wash my whole body. What Jesus just did was a humiliating task. To give his disciples a pedicure. Now I'm going to tell you, I don't like feet. I don't even like my own feet. Like I wash my feet and I like stick the rag in there and make sure they're all clean and you know I clip my toenails and all that kind of stuff. But I don't like it. Jesus was selfless. Sitting at a dinner with a bunch of disciples that had selfish hearts, with a bunch of disciples that had dirty feet. And Jesus stopped eating, got up, grabbed a towel, and washed their feet. Maybe this isn't hitting us quite the way I wanted to. Let me rephrase this. Jesus, the Son of God, Jesus, the bread of life, Jesus, the Prince of Peace, Jesus, the living water, Jesus, the light of the world, Jesus, the great high priest, Jesus, the Lamb of God, Jesus, the living stone, Jesus, the righteous judge, Jesus, the true vine, Jesus, the King of glory, Jesus, the Messiah, Jesus, the chosen one, Jesus, the name above all names, Jesus, the King of kings, Jesus, the Lord of lords, Jesus, the Alpha and the Omega, Jesus, our Redeemer, our Rock, our sanctification, Jesus, our righteousness, kneels before disciples' feet and washes them. Jesus did not come to be served. He came to serve. One of the uncomfortable truths about being a disciple of Jesus is that he calls us to the same thing. Jesus does not call us to have a better life, a healthy life, a rich life, all that kind of stuff. Jesus calls us to deny ourselves and maybe even wash somebody's feet. And some of us sitting in this room or watching online have convinced ourselves, no, 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 let me rephrase that. Some of us have let the prince of lies, the deceiver, the one who hides in the shadows, some of us have let him convince us that we have no place in the kingdom. Some of us have let Satan deceive us saying that unless we do something big, we're nothing to God. But the Prince of Peace, the true vine in in which we are all attached, the great high priest who speaks into our lives, the the light of the world, says that even in his kingdom, even the little things are the big things. He says that whoever chooses to give even a glass of water to the least of these, gives it to me. In the kingdom of God, even the little things are the big things. Think about this for a moment. And I I know that Many of us serve not to get recognition. We serve just because Jesus has served us and calls us to serve others. But if you think about Jack opening the door for you this morning, even the little things are the big things. You think about Sandra, who comes in every single weekend and cleans the church building. Even the little things are the big things. You think about Sean, who's sitting in the sound booth right now, watching the video, so that people in our community and in our state can watch and listen to the gospel of Jesus. Even the little things are the big things. You think about so many of us who serve in a variety of different ways, 
whether it be in kids' ministry or kitchen ministry, whether it be on the soundboard or holding a baby. Even the little things are the big things. So what are you always doing? If somebody looked at you and said, you're always doing blank, whatever that is, use it. Not for your own selfish desires, but use it. Deny yourselves, but still use it for the kingdom of God. Whether that's holding a baby, greeting a guest, opening your home up for dinner, whether that's carrying a bag, welcoming a stranger, loving a teenager, whether that's reading to a child in the nursery, whether that's cooking for a gathering, giving the coat off your back, bringing a lunch, offering a ride, or carrying a towel. Even the little things are the big things. And there's going to come a day when Jesus steps off of his throne and returns. And he's going to say something to his disciples. What he's not going to say is, well done, good and faithful preacher. Well done, good and faithful evangelist. Well done, good and faithful computer person. Well done, good and faithful greeter at the door. Well done, good and faithful nursery worker. That's not what he's going to say. He's going to say, well done, good and faithful servant. Take a look with me one more time at Matthew chapter 23. The what? Greatest. The goat among you, the greatest of all time among you, will be what? Your servant. I want to end with a question this morning. There is no doubt in my mind that Jesus, being the one who taught us to serve, is calling you to serve in some way, in some capacity. I don't know what that looks like for you, but none of us can escape it. Whether we're old or young, he's calling us to be servants. What does that look like for you? I want to invite you after service to just tell somebody. Have somebody hold you accountable to it. I don't know what that is to you, but I know God's calling. Let's pray. Father, we are grateful to come before your throne in the name of Jesus. We are grateful, Father, that that your Son, being the King of kings and Lord of lords, took on flesh. And although he could have been greeted on a white horse with a beautiful robe and a crown of gold. He chose to serve and give his life. He chose to deny himself. He chose to ride a donkey with a dirty robe and a crown of thorns. Father, help us understand what it looks like to deny ourselves and to serve. You've gifted each and every one of these people, and you're calling them into your presence and into your kingdom. My prayer, Father, by the power of your Holy Spirit, is that you convict them that you have gifted them, that they have a place, and that we have a family as the family of God. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Okay. This is our time of offering. And don't pass a hat, a plate of boot, anything like that. I'm giving our offering outside this door. Double doors. Online. CLC. What is it? CCLCfamily.org. There it is. And um, I just want to encourage you. Um, to understand how you can serve even through giving, how you can worship even through offering.
Um, so excited for that. Um, whoever finds Christ. Oh, I forgot to say something. No, I didn't. Did I? Did I? I don't know. I'll talk to you later. Peace out. All right. <laughs>